In 1972, early in the year, I became a New Testament Christian. It was not long after that that I, although I was living in southern Ohio, heard of the Brown Trail School of Preaching. For the next several years, as I heard the school mention, time after time after time, good things were said of the school, the congregation, and the work that was being done. I had the opportunity to come to work with the school in 2002 as uh, an instructor and then eventually coming on as the uh, director. And uh, as I look back over the history of the school, the number of years that she has existed, there have been a number of fine men who have gone through the school of preaching. It's our prayer, of course, that there will be a number in the future of just as fine of individuals who will do so and who will prepare themselves to be gospel preachers. Shane Coleman, in my estimation, is one of those fine men. I had Shane in a number of classes and uh, always enjoyed having him uh, in the classes, participating in uh, everything that he could participate in and helping to make the school experience a better experience. Shane is a native of Texas. He's been married to uh, Mary Sue for 19 years, uh, and they have two children. He, as I've said, is a graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching, and since graduating, he has done local work uh, here in Texas and then in Oklahoma. And he presently serves as the located preacher for the uh, Sari Oklahoma congregation uh, and is involved in uh, lectureship and gospel meeting work uh, in several different areas. I'm sure that Shane will present a lesson that will be of great value to each of us, so we would encourage you to take your Bibles and prepare to learn more from God's eternal word. I want to say thank you and uh, 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 how great it is to be here, a great privilege I have enjoyed attending the, the lectureship for, for years and have heard about it, and uh, this is a great pleasure. I am so, uh, so fond of the congregation here at Brown Trail. They've done so much uh, for Mary Sue and the kids and I while we were uh, here at uh, going through the school, and, uh, and their work that they continue to do in the school as well as the truth and love uh, that is uh, something that is so important in the kingdom of God, and, and it, is, uh, it is my prayer, and I know it's yours too, that their, God's blessing continue to be upon this work. I'm thankful for the kind words of, of Bob because I appreciate and love him so much and his dedication and his soundness that continues in the work to turn out good gospel preachers. I appreciated the visit from... Uh, Brother Maxie and Fran, they was able to find their way all the way up to Sarah, Oklahoma. You know, you have to be going there to get there. And uh, we we, uh, had a great uh, visit, even though it was short, uh, with them fine people. And uh, once uh, he asked me to to be on this lectureship, and I certainly uh, uh, accepted it uh, wholeheartedly, he gave me the uh, assignment, and I swallowed hard. And... uh, We are going to uh, do our best to get through the second preaching journey of the Apostle Paul. And uh, you have the outline. Uh, It uh, didn't come with the title that I had given it because uh, it uh, uh, would help contain and help uh, for you to follow along. And as I was pondering this out, looking about what I could do with the, the extensive material within 38 minutes... I decided to go uh, uh, a way that uh, you might want to write a title change that God can believe in. And while I was thinking about what I would say, whether I would uh, expose the entire text, I timed myself, I can read the entire text in less than 38 minutes. But we do that often, as we should. And the book of Acts is a a well-studied book within congregations, and we can study and study it and and uh, always glean more from it. I'm a practical kind of guy, uh, so this is, 
it was kind of odd for me, I thought, to even be on the lectureship because I, I think pretty practical. And I want to talk about it in the most practical way. So you can have the outline, you can scribble through it, mark through it, make an airplane, or line your birdcage with it when you get home. Whatever you want, I hope that this will be beneficial to you. Change that God can believe in. You know, change is important. Everyone goes through changes. We've known people that go through some sort of changes. Some changes are positive, some are negative. Some of them, some of those changes we're able to come through as goals. Some changes some folks are just not able to bear for whatever reason. But there's change that God can believe in. And I want to contrast it that way because it seems like in these modern days that there's always this call for change. This movement, movement away from the scriptures, they're uh, hiding it underneath the, the, the uh, postmodern uh, idea and the, and the movement has even gone farther than perhaps we ever thought it would, but it is still called change. Where I preach out in western Oklahoma, the people consider that out in the middle of nowhere, it is the sticks. It is the, it's, it's those that would say that would change the least of, of anybody that you can think of. But you know what, there's still changes that are trying to reach in even amongst uh, the corners of this globe. Even within the church, and, and I'm thinking, there's that type of change, but how about the change that God can believe in? How about the type of change that God would approve and so I want to, this afternoon, reignite and reopen your hearts and your minds as we look at the Scripture, as we look and begin in Acts chapter 16, uh, uh, regarding the change that went about in the first century with the simplistic preaching, the simplistic message. You see that today that uh, anything simple would, uh, would just be for the simple-minded. And we are able to see that the change that is brought back and brought uh, unto the people of the first century, as we'll go through here, this change was immediate. It was either rejected or accepted, and it was done so on an immediate basis. I was talking uh, earlier uh, in, the, in the hour with a, with a brother. We were talking about, about the Bible studies that we have today. And we may study with somebody and we say, you know what, I think... I think I'll just leave you with this and let you think over it overnight and ponder it and, and sleep on it. That is not what they did in the first century. When there was preaching going on, we're going to find that there was an immediate change. Those that had a good and honest heart, there was an immediate change. There was no sleeping on it. There was no waiting or, or consulting family members or whatever. People either accepted it and rejected it. And I want to go through that because I want to just highlight just a few of the places uh, in these chapters where we find change that God can believe in. It is something that God is happy with when we find the change. And so let's begin in Acts chapter 16. Oh, we've got a long way to go. And oh, by the way, Bob, this still says 38.00. So uh, just want to let you know that. Chapter 16 and verse number 1. We've got to go all the way through Acts chapter 18 and verse number 22. That's a long way to go, and I'll do my best, and I pray that you'll be uh, be inspired by the scriptures here. You know, the very first change that we see that I would like to highlight uh, without completely reading the entire text is Timothy. There was a change that was brought about in a young man, Timothy. We know that he was a son of mixed heritage. His father was Greek. His mother and grandmother, according to 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5, were Christians of a Jewish heritage. And so therefore, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this has changed. He was young also, and he was of a good reputation in his hometown. And folks, uh, uh, we may not have very many young people uh, in attendance here, but we can, we can help uh, encourage those that are that it is important to have a good reputation. And you can have a good reputation when you become a Christian, when you love the things of the Lord, and when you accept and respond to God's grace in the way that He would have and shine the light of Jesus, we find that that's exactly what... Go because He was trained in the Scriptures. You know, we want our kids uh, to do great things. We want them to have a great education. 
We want them to be a success in life. But really, when we all boil it down, what was most important, we find right here that Timothy was trained in the Scriptures. And his mother and grandmother saw that, uh, that his training was that which would please God. He was considered, Timothy was considered Paul's own son. What greater title could one have than to be considered the son, the son of the great apostle Paul? But that's what happens when you have a good reputation. That's what happens when you're trained by the Scriptures. Folks, that's what happens when one's life is opened up to the Scriptures and you obey the Gospel and you walk in the paths of God. This is what happened. It, it, it's not something new. It's not a mystery. It is a, it's, it's not something that not all can attain. We all can do that. We just need to be about the Lord's business. We also think, I'm thinking, not going too much deeper into it, that Paul had Timothy circumcised, and there was a change even Timothy there, not just the physical, but uh, but perhaps the mental, if you really think about what went on here. And the reason that Timothy was circumcised is because he was a half-blood Jew, And within that circumcision, within that act, let me tell you, even being considered a son son of Paul, even being, being a fine, young, upstanding Christian young man, he was going to have to undergo this painful process in order for the furtherance of the gospel. That's what happens when you love the Lord. That's what happens when you put Christ first. We, first, we, 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 we learned that last night about Jesus Christ. He is to be the center of our life. And when He is the center of our life, then everything else falls secondary to it, even, even when it may cause us pain. That's change that God can believe in. Going on down in the chapter, we could go through and spend an enormous amount of time, but I just want to stop there at verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5, because there's a change that goes on here, and he says, And they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. These churches, these churches were undergoing the change. Now change not to modernism, but a change to to true spiritual matters. And therefore this decree, this uh, personal delivery of a decree is exactly what they needed. And these decrees were for the purpose of peace and harmony among the Jews and the Gentile converts. There needs to be peace and harmony within the congregations of the Lord's people. There were fighting and fussing because of race, because of background. We're simply doing that today also. There needs to be this peace. And by the decree of God, God will say, my people will have peace. You know, when you have a congregation that has peace in there, and, and don't, don't get me wrong, this, this peace does not come at any price because we must stand firm in the doctrine of God. But I want to say when it comes to the little petty things, uh, the matters of expediency, those need to be stifled because of peace. And when peace reigns, congregations grow, both numerically and especially spiritually. These ordinances held the authority of deity and the authority of the apostles and the authority of the elders of Jerusalem. I want to highlight here the organization of the church here because there was a change here from, from the... From the uh, Uh, the old Jewish ways of the clergy laity all the way uh, into this form, deity by the apostles and then rest ultimately upon the backs of the shepherds of that church and that they were to carry that out. They needed this information. They needed that which we find here. And this decree consisted of the abstinence of four things, Acts chapter 15 and verse number 25. And you know, and there are many things that we look today, people are today are wondering what we can get away with. What can we do extra? 
You know, uh, and, and, and instead we find a decree here about things you need to abstain from. There are some things that they're doing that they need to stop doing. And so we find here, just put them out here, uh, that which was uh, uh, dealing uh, uh, to abstain anything that had been sacrificed to idols from blood, uh, that which had been strangled, and stay away and abstain from the sexual immorality uh, that the areas were encompassed in. And so we find, even in that, that there was uh, a great decree, uh, these rules, and uh, this come from God on high. God gives us everything we've ever needed. He's answered every question for it. So therefore, if there is a change to come in our life, and it comes by way of the authority of the Scriptures, that's the change God can believe in. And that's the change that we still need to call for today. And so churches, it's okay to change, and there are some things we need to abstain from, but we need to follow the New Testament pattern. We need to have Bible authority for the things that we do, and for the matters of expediency, peace must reign. That's change God can believe in. We need that change today. We need that change today. We need to return back to the Bible, back to the old paths, and back to peace. You know, Paul's mind was changed. <clears throat> Paul's mind was changed in just a few verses down from there uh, uh, regarding uh, what he thought he wanted to do and what God really wanted him to do. You know, you, uh, w you can look through this and... and uh, the Apostle Paul had the best of intentions, and, and, uh, and uh, I, I'm thinking as these men were walking down the road, going, going from place to place, uh, in the service of the Lord, I wanted to have a song, but we just couldn't get it through here today. And the title is, Swiftly We're Turning. And if you know the chorus there, it says, Into our hands, the you know how it goes, Into our hands the gospel is given. And so they were singing down the, down the roads. Into our hands the gospel is given. And we're going to preach to anybody that we come to, but I want you to know in verses 6 through 10 here, as we look here, that there was a little bit of a change that needed to go on. Now that when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. We know that the Asia mentioned here cannot be the Asia Minor in general, uh, but we know uh, this is more likely the proconsular of Asia, which, which included some other places. But there was, there was this change that come by. There was a change. And it's nothing new. We find the prophets of old were forbidden to preach. Ezekiel 3 and verse 26. And yet these, these, uh, uh, these uh, faithful men of God uh, perhaps were, were forbidden or told that they were not able to preach in one place or another. The Lord just simply directed them to another place that was more needful. Because His all-seeing eye is able to know of the better places there, that the, which the reception is going to be. And we'll talk and learn more about that. But others perhaps were working with there. But the Lord wanted Paul and Silas to get down to Macedonia. The time is right. The people are right. Their hearts are right. That's change God can believe in. Even, the, even, even when we have the best of motives, even when we think we're doing well, there are times in our lives God is going to direct us somehow, some way, to another direction. He may do that by chastening. There may be done that by some sort of suffering. But Lord wants us to continue to do His work. And so I challenge you all as we're looking at this, this, this change that, that we reignite the fire to tell people about Jesus. That simple message. Why aren't we doing that today? Why aren't... Why, 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 uh, why are we not converting uh, people to Christ? Why are we not carrying out Bible studies like we used to? Why are the gospel meetings uh, poorly attended? Why are the congregations shrinking in number? 
Now, I'm not the smartest guy, but I am a thinker, and I believe it's just one word. It's fear. It's fear. And so with that in mind, I'm hoping that you will look and see that the change that comes by the preaching of the Word, that there are hearts and souls and ready to accept it and believe it. And when I'm talking about belief, we, we're looking at belief here in uh, this context here as a responding and obeying the gospel plan of salvation. Folks, we can do it and we need to be reignited uh, into doing that because we know that the gospel is God's plan to Uh, is God's power to change people. We have within our hands that gospel. Change is coming when we go on and look down and we stop there in uh, chapter 16, verses 11 through 13, we see change that come to Philippi, a Roman colony uh, populated by Roman soldiers. And, and I love this. It's probably my, my favorite part here because of patriotism was something that was displayed citywide. their dress, their custom, their pride. It was all about the, uh, the, the pride. The colonial pride was harnessed for some as the call became a, a, a colony of heaven. And I, I was thinking about that as we look back over to Philippians 1 and verse 27. This is how God knew this was the right time. This is the direction that God needed to uh, uh, bring Paul into because the recipient of this would, 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 would go. The, the war-torn soldiers of Rome uh, from hearing the, the gospel would, of course, uh, become soldiers of Christ engaged in the fight against the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Where they would use swords and shields to fight their foe, a different battle would be waged for those who underwent the change that God could believe in. And that's the type of change that we can uh, still encourage within the world today. We have so much work to do. And so when we look at the, at the change that goes on here in these few chapters, we know uh, within this that that, that great uh, change for the Lord is something that comes only through the gospel. It's, it's not real if it's not based in truth. It's not real if it's just based in emotion. It's not real if it's based or, or covered or shrouded in family and preconceived ideas, traditions, and so on. True change that God can believe in comes from obeying the truth by relying and lying in the scriptures of God. When we're looking on, we find that the Philippian jailer, the Philippian jailer there was, was one that, that, was, that was great. When we go on down into the latter part of, of this chapter, we find that even that soldier and goings on there can find the change that the gospel can bring. Even though preaching of the gospel landed Paul and Silas in prison and they were singing those tunes, they had been singing perhaps on the road on the way into the cities, but now they were singing from the dungeons. What a change. What a change that would bring forth. And so, folks, we know that the change that God brings is something uh, that we can rest our life in and we know that the rewards in heaven are great. Sometimes that change will upset people. It will upset our families, it will upset our friends. Because of that internal war that is being brought out and when we find those people that obey the gospel of Christ, there are some that are persecuted because of that because of that great change. And we find that happening right here in these few chapters, but we find that that obedience to the gospel was immediate. That change was a change for the better, is for the positive. Even though it might have brought on uh, pain and anguish, it was still 
worthy. You know, it always pays to serve God. It pays to serve God no matter what. And when one changes, and those changes are brought about by the gospel of Christ, you, you just can't keep it in. you just got to go out and you've got to tell others about Jesus. When we continue on and looking over at chapter 17, as we have to uh, hurry through this uh, look here, chapter 17, we find great changes even brought here. Change will come to one place, even in the midst of an uprising, and Paul would have to go to another place in order to preach. He wasn't going to get bogged down on it, and he wasn't going to get discouraged because of it. And folks, you and I must uh, remain in that type of example as well. We may become discouraged, even for a short amount of time, and we've, we, we are able to uh, rest and lean upon our families, our church families, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we might be, uh, uh, have that fire uh, rekindled in us, that we may continue to go on and walk the great ways of God. But we find in chapter 17, the change was even brought to Thessalonica. And so we find here the Thessalonians that Paul had engaged as was custom as he always did here the Jews concerning Christ and that always landed him in hot water but Paul was not going to shy away from talking about Jesus Christ even though it was a controversy even though it would land him perhaps either in prison or being beaten or whatever it might be one is not going to shy away from the gospel he was not ashamed of it he would walk right into those synagogues and teach Jesus. He expounded, propounded, provided proof from the Scripture. And folks, that's important for us to, to realize and remember today. When we're going out and, and we're going to, to tell someone about Jesus, folks, we need to be competent, we need to know the Scriptures, and we need to provide proof. The TV preachers and all of those evangelists of the world, you know, they'll say and feel and touch and all of that stuff. But the Christian, a New Testament Christian, is just going to bring the New Testament. He's going to bring scriptures. He's going to know how to use them for the glory of God. That one might be saved. This doctrine, this, this uh, talk, this... this uh, a teaching that Paul was teaching uh, was a stumbling block to the Jews and was absolutely foolish to the Gentiles that Paul taught it anyway. They needed to hear it. He was compelled to say it and he did not come any short of doing so because that is what happens. Some of the Jews stumbled and then yet recovered and believed and obeyed. Some of the, the Gentiles found wisdom even in the salvation of the cross. And also some women were convinced by the gospel of grace. And so when we are preaching and when we're teaching, when we're telling someone about Jesus, some of those things are hard. Some of those things are hard, but change that God can believe in will come when we stick straight with the scriptures. The gospel of Christ also breaks down barriers everywhere we go today. Even at, during this time in the, in the first century, there were barriers. And that is why we still have this problem today. It's fear. It's fear of the barriers that are put up. And if we use the gospel of Christ in a way in which it was designed and in its simplicity, those barriers can be broken down. They can be torn down. Jesus broke the racial barrier. Jesus broke the racial barrier. The gospel of Christ breaks down the, the, the barrier of race. It is the power of God to save man, whether Jew or Gentile, but also whether man or woman, regardless of, of whether you're male or female, regardless of how much money you have in the bank, regardless of your social status, regardless of whether you even heard or have even believed in God, there is something there, and it all begins with the tearing down of a barrier. That's what the gospel does. It's so simple. 
The gospel is given to us, and we're just afraid to use it. I guess we're just afraid of what people are going to say to us. I guess we're afraid of failing. I, I guess we're just going to uh, uh, afraid that we might not speak well, or, or they may want to talk about some other matter of religion rather than salvation, and we're going to get off into some muddy water that we're not prepared to do so, but it's about fear. But if we study... We use God's gospel. We use the gospel of Jesus Christ in the way it was designed in its simplicity, preaching the plan of salvation. It works every time. And change can be had. Chapter 17, verses 10, all the way 10 through verse number 15. We, we, we've, we've known the noble Marians. We learned that in Bible class, didn't we? we even when we were small. We learned to memorize. And we, we learned that searching the Scripture daily is something that we must be known for. But there were some that rejected the gospel even then. Folks, this is a reality. People are going to reject the gospel of Christ. People are going to say, no, I want none of it. There are some that will half-heartedly take a look and half-heartedly uh, come to the Lord, if you will, being compelled by family or friends. That's, that's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, and it's still wrong. But there are those good and honest hearts that are open and ready and willing to receive and obey the gospel of Christ. That's the Bereans. They received it. They researched it. And they responded to it. That's a good and honest heart. And so, folks, we find that's the type of change. That's the type of people that we need to be, in, uh, to, to be, and we need to encourage people to do also. When we provide the gospel uh, in its simplicity, we're going to provide proof. We're going to provide proof. You know, when we were at Sarah looking and going through and examining our, our next evangelistic uh, opportunity. There's some training that's going on that we will take our uh, a couple of Bibles with us and we're going to sit down so that we ensure that, that the one that we're studying with is able to open up the Scriptures and read it for themselves so that they are able to research it and they are able to see for themselves. Promote the change that God can believe in. Chapter 18 is so full of changes, so full of positive changes for the, for the betterment of the kingdom because people are being saved, people are being encouraged, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of trouble and violence. And it leads off with Aquila and Priscilla. I'd like to highlight this just for a moment because of, uh, of, of this point here. Uh, just really has three points. And this is something when we're thinking about our life and we're thinking about that neighbor. We're thinking about that neighbor that we have not told, uh, we've not uh, spoken the gospel uh, to them about. And, and there's a song that we sing, you never mentioned him to me. You never mentioned him to me. I want you to realize that there's always an opportunity. Every minute we're breathing, every place we go, there's an opportunity. Of whatever we're doing, wherever we're going, and whoever we meet. And that's what I think about Aquila and Priscilla. We don't know if they're Christians. It's just about opportunities. It's about taking advantage of every one of those opportunities that's placed in front of us that we, that we may never hear and think of those frightful words to some of, of our neighbors, maybe current or those that have gone by, you never mentioned him to me. 
That's a task for all of us. And we can do it. Because we have the gospel. And it does save. Paul encountered Corinth. We could spend a lot of time on Corinth uh, about the the uh, immorality at its highest. The, uh, uh, the, the people were Corinthianized. They, they, they were just sick in within this. But Paul is able to set up there because these people need the gospel. So many times we're saying, you know, so and so uh, is, is, is just not going to accept the gospel, so why bother? The Apostle Paul is going to stand up here in chapter 18. We're going to find within these people, even with, within, it may seem hopeless. We must continue to preach, and we find within this that the message remains the same. It remains simple, and the results will always be the same. You have the same message with an open heart, an honest heart. You'll have the change that God can believe in, and it all is about Jesus Christ. Some people will come into a church building and on Sundays and Wednesdays and in meetings. And they'll talk about the economy. They'll talk about real estate. They'll talk about this. They'll talk about that. And I guess some people come to hear that. But what we find right here in the book of Acts, especially in, in this second preaching journey, it's exactly what Paul was doing. He was preaching. He was preaching the same message, the very same message that the apostle started it all out with, and it was Jesus Christ. It always ends within that type of change. Because when we find the change that comes by the way of the gospel of Christ, we can be reassured of the change to come into the glory just as Jesus is. And that's the type of change that God can believe in, and therefore we have that endeavor in front of us. The people of Corinth. And look down in with me in verse number 6. Verse number 6 here says, But when they opposed him and blasphemed him, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own hands, I am clean, for I will now go to the Gentiles. And so therefore that gospel that was always given to the Jews first, Paul goes right to the, to the Gentiles as the prescription of God, and we find that sometimes that's aggravating. But we continue to go and preach even though... And even though there was a promise, even though we find when we're looking down in verse number 7 through 11 here, Paul is taken, we find here that he entered into the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. And we continue to look down there and find that he was able to, to get this, this great promise that he would not undergo any type of, of violence. His, his message would not be uh, prevented in any way. There are times and places in this world where we cannot go. There are places that the gospel cannot go right yet or undergoes great persecution, but we're going to go anyway. But here in America, we, have, we are, are so free to do so. We have all of the technology to do so. We have the wherewithal to do so, but we're not doing it. I want to take you back to that time as I close when you could say what a difference he made in my life. What a difference he made in my life. We read through the book of Acts here, especially right here in 16, chapter 16, 17, and 18, we find the difference that the gospel makes in other people's lives and then yet we hold it to ourselves. We do not tell our neighbors. We do not tell our co-workers, our peers. Engage in those religious uh, discussions. Folks, it's up to us. We can do it. We want to uh, find and, and uh, emulate and imitate the example of the Apostle Paul. 
You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to go through a preacher training school. We just have to take the gospel because into our hands it was given. I want to thank you for your attention and, and, and encouragement uh, that you'll find in this great book of Acts that we continue on. And with that, thank you so much.